Hello and welcome. I am Alex Miller, aka Carney7, and this is a video for UpswingPoker.com, where, with the aid of a couple of hands I played with Phil Ivy and Red Baron at 200 on PokerStars, I'm going to be explaining about C betting on monotone flops. So, why am I making videos for UpswingPoker.com? It's because soon I've got an advanced course coming out on Six Max No Limit Hold'em. And I think it's going to be great. I spent a lot of time on it. I think it's really going to help anybody who buys it. So please check that out when it arrives. But back to this particular video, why have I chosen monotone flops? And it's because I think it's a somewhat under-researched area. People generally look at the most common sorts of flops initially, you know, very reasonable as they should. But by the time they get some monotone flops, they're a little bit weird, a little bit different. Strategies don't quite look like they do in other places. So I think people kind of just give up and maybe play a little bit like they do elsewhere. So I think by making this video, I can provide a lot of value, not just in terms of actually improving how you play on monotone flops, but also the things that you need to understand in order to play well on monotone flops. I think they apply really well elsewhere as well. So let's get into it. So to help see what's going on on these monotone flops, I've run a bunch of boards on a private solver. So if I get rid of the filter for monotone flops for a moment, we can see that this is the spot where we're in the button and our opponent is in the big blind. And we should be C betting about 62% of the time. We're checking 38%, C betting 62% on average across this wide selection of different flops. You can also see our bet sizings here. We've got a ton of different bet sizings used from quarter pot or so all the way up to about one and a half times pot. And these sizings are used on uh, on different flops. The advantage of this private solver over many com commercially available ones is that it works out bet sizings for itself in any given spot. So. That's why you're seeing such a wide selection of different sizings used rather than just it having two sizings and it has to pick one of them on, on any flop. So we've got a wide selection of sizes used and we're C betting 62% of the time. If we filter this, however, for monotone flops, then you can see that our C bet frequency has gone down to about half the time. We're now checking 49% and betting therefore 51%. And our sizing is also now almost exclusively half pot or smaller. So for some reason, we've decided we're going to put a lot less money in on monotone flops when we're c-betting than on other flops. Not only are we c-betting less often, but we're also c-betting smaller sizes on average. And this isn't immediately intuitive as to why that's the case. You know, both players have got some flushes, both players have got a bunch more flush draws. If you're just thinking about how the equities of the ranges match up versus each other, you might kind of think there's not going to be a huge amount of difference really between a monotone flop and a non-monotone flop. But for some reason, we're really reluctant to put in as much money as we normally are. So... Let's have a think about why that is. And there's two approaches that you can sort of take to this, and both of them are necessary in this case. So the first thing you need to think about is how the ranges match up versus each other. And the second is thinking about individual hands and what their incentives are to bet or check. And in this video, we're gonna go over the first of those. So we're gonna go over how the ranges match up versus each other. And then in my next video next week, we're going to look at a different situation. So when we're actually facing a C-bet and you know how we're gonna fold or call and check raise versus a C-bet, a big blind versus button. And then that scenario, we're gonna focus more on the other part. So looking at individual hands and how they should play. So for this video then, looking at how the ranges match up versus each other. First thing is that many people think of things in terms of their C-betting strategies and just terms of equity of one range versus equity of another range but that doesn't really provide us the answers we need when we're thinking about how often we should bet what our sizing should be for a start it's only one metric you know you've got one number for equity of our range versus our opponent's range yet we've got these two things of sizings and frequencies so just from this one number you can't really determine the sizings and frequencies together and it turns out you can't even really get an overall idea for, from equities what you really need to do is think about fast forwarding to the river. If you've got a bunch of really strong hands on the river and your opponent's got barely any, you're probably gonna to want to bet those really strong hands for a big size. And then you're gonna have an appropriate number of bluffs for a big size as well, so your opponent doesn't know that you're just really strong. And then if you were to think about a different situation on the river where you don't have that many strong hands compared to your opponent, but you do have a bunch of hands that are just about strong enough to bet, then you're probably gonna be betting a much smaller size and having some bluffs with that smaller size but you're not going to bet a really big size if you don't have a lot of strong hands you're not going to bet a really small size if you have just a ton of strong hands and not many weaker hands that want to bet and you can take that concept back through to the flop is there's more sort of factors in play because there's more streets to come more action to come so it's not the only thing you think about on the flop whereas on the river it's more sort of that's the be all and end all 
but that's a really good starting point still. So if we find that we've got a bunch of really strong hands on the flop and our opponent doesn't have very many, we're probably going to want to think about potentially betting a bigger size. If we don't have many very strong hands and our opponent has more, we're probably going to be limited to betting a smaller size. So let's look at a few hand examples. And I've just got some hands I've played. This one is playing with Red Baron and Phil Ivy at 200-400 on Pokestars. And Red Baron's really one of the people that's played very well with bet sizing for a long time. So we're just going to look at some flops, see how he's played in terms of his sizing when he's see betting these flops, and see how they match up with what we think they should, should happen. So looking at this first flop then, we've got an ace-king-9. And on this flop, we can see we're going to have pocket aces if we're... Well, Red Baron is going to have pocket aces, I should say. And they're going to, he's going to have pocket kings. He's going to have ace king. He's also going to have pocket nines, ace nine, king nine, and so on. So Red Baron's got pretty much all the strong hands that you can have in this scenario. Phil Ivy, on the other hand, in the big blind, he'd have been three betting aces preflop. He'd have been three betting kings, ace king preflop, and so on. So also probably ace queen, he'd be three betting preflop. So the Red Baron's going to have all of ace queen. So the Red Baron's really got a nice advantage at the top of the ranges here. So this is a flop where we're going to expect that he's probably going to be using a big size because by using a big size, he can put Phil Ivy in a really difficult spot because he's got these, say, might be 10% of his range or something, his ace-queen or better. Then he's also got some ace-jack, ace-10 that can probably bet big and then a bunch of weaker hands and air, which is going to be used as a bluffs on future streets. So he can bet this not super wide, but relatively wide range for a pretty big size. And Phil Ivy's just not really got anything to counteract that. He's not going to be able to check raise a lot of the time because he doesn't have the very top end hands. And he's also going to have to be worried about big bets on future streets if the turns are blank and so on. So that's why it's really going to be good for the Red Baron to be betting big here. And as we can see, if we click through, pot's at $1,940 on the flop and the Red Baron's actually over betting, betting about 2.6K. So exactly as we expect here, it's a flop where you want to be betting a big size and that's what the Baron is doing. If we take in a completely different flop, for example, though, so now this is the red baron on the button and I'm in the big blind and we've got a flop which is 5-4 deuce with two spades. This is totally the opposite scenario. I'm going to have 6-3 suited in my range. I'm going to have ace-3. I'm going to have all the sets in the big blind. I'm going to have 5-4 off suit probably, 5 do suited and so on. Whereas the baron on the button, he's going to be opening ace-3 suited, but probably not ace-3 off suit. He's maybe going to be opening 6-3 suited but maybe not he's going to have all the sets but then he's probably going to have 5-4 suited but not off suit so generally the baron is just going to be doing worse at the top of the ranges on this flop and i'm going to be doing better so he's not really going to have the option of betting a big size on this flop because most of the hands that he's going to want to be betting are a little bit weaker and they don't really want to put loads more money in the pot when i can check raise quite a bit so if, if he's betting a big size, then I'm check raising a big size and so on. That's going to be really bad for his hands, which are a little bit more mediocre than they were on the ace-king line. So as we can see, we click through and the Baron is indeed betting less than $700 into this pot of 2200 So we've got two examples there of very different board types. And if we think about a monotone board, so I'll bring one in here now, we're much more towards the second example. Not exactly at the second example, things are a little bit different, but what's going to be very clear is that both players have a bunch of flushes. So at the top of the ranges, it's going to be relatively equal. We're not going to have some scenario where 10% of our range or something is flushes and our opponent's only got 3 or 4% of their range being flushes. It's, our opponent's just going to be flatting too many suited hands preflop. So it's going to be maybe 6% each or something of the range is going to be flushes. And then after that, we've got sort of the sets and two pairs. So any advantage that we had at sets and two pairs, it's just going to be a little bit further down in our ranges. So we're not going to really be able to bet the really big sizes that we're going to see in other situations like that ace-king-9. So that's why monotone flops end up with a smaller bet sizing than they do uh, than other flops do. That's why we don't see any of the big bets that we saw when we looked at the overall strategies for see betting and we saw that we even had some over bets and we never see that with monotone flops and that's just why because both players have flushes at the top end we do, without a top end advantage like that we're really not going to want to be having this really big sizing so we can again see that the baron here is betting small on this three flush board betting three hundred dollars into a pot of nearly a thousand so so yeah so to recap if we bring in our powerpoint slide again 
So when we've got a big advantage at the top of the ranges, we're going to want to be betting a bigger size. If most of our hands that want to bet are weaker, we're going to be, want to be betting a smaller size. And that's really quite straightforward. It sounds very intuitive, but I think it's not exactly how a lot of people think about the game. So really getting that sort of into your head, that's what we're thinking about when we're choosing our bet sizes. I think that's going to help in all sorts of scenarios in terms of picking a bet size that's good rather than just having to have one standard bet size and not really altering it. So on Montane Flops, we've got no big advantage at top of the ranges and therefore we're not using big sizes. And if we look at our solver, strategy then I think choosing something like you know we use anything between quarter pot and half pot really I think choosing something like a third pot is going to be pretty good and betting about half the time so from that we can take a default strategy if we see a monotone flop and we don't have any special insights as to how the ranges match up versus each other compared to your average monotone flop we can have this default strategy of c betting half the time with a third pot sizing and I think you're going to be playing really well there on monotone flops compared to a lot of people because it's very tempting on a monotone flop you've got a bunch of flushes you've got a bunch of other strong hands like two pairs that seem like they're good to bet and then you've also got a bunch of hands with a flush draw much more flush draws than you normally do because just one spade on a three spade flop is good enough for a flush draw whereas normally of course you need two spades if the board only has two spades on it to, to have a flush draw so we've got a bunch of hands that look like a lot of got a lot of equity, got a bunch of hands that look pretty strong. So a temptation is to even bet more often on one two flops than normal, but actually it should be less and the sizing should be smaller. So yeah, I think that's gonna be it for this video. Hopefully that's given you a good idea of how to play on monotone flops and also given you some food for thought on how that's gonna be applied to different situations, different flop types and so on. I hope you'll join me again for a video next week. And like I said, that's gonna be playing against CBETs big blind versus button and then we're going to be looking at the incentives individual hand types because even from what I've talked about in this scenario if you were to look at something with similar ranges to the Monte stuff I've talked about where you've got this sort of chunk at the top for both players with a bunch of flushes if you were to find some similar situation where both players have a chunk of straights or whatever else, then you would still tend to find that we would be betting more often in these other situations than we would be on the monotone flop. So we haven't fully explained it yet just by looking at how the ranges match up versus each other. And that's what I'm going to do in the next video. So I hope you'll join me for that. I'll see you then.